Well, I went out and I was uh, running the other day. It was a rare, cool day in August, so I figured I could start running outside again. <laughs> and um, I wasn't alone out on the trail because it was cool. There were a lot of people that were out there. And I caught myself as I'm running past all these people on the trail. I'd, I'd run past them and I'd say, howdy, how's it going? You know, and I was just, just a little greeting. And it's, that's a small thing. I'm sure many of you might do the same thing. But I was transported in my mind suddenly back to my time in Chicago on the south side when I was in Hyde Park in seminary. I never put two and two together, but I'd run along the lake or run around the city of Chicago and I'd do the same thing. I'd pass somebody and I'd be like, hey, how's it going? And it didn't quite work the same way. When I would do that, mothers would start holding their children a little close and, and people would cross to the other side of the street or they'd get out their phone and pretend to be talking to somebody. They were too busy to see me, right? Who is this crazy person who's saying hello to me that doesn't know me? I think they're just a little more focused up there. So we'll ask intern Amy about that. But, you know, I, I started thinking about that. Who do we see and who do we not see? And I started thinking about this, this woman from the gospel. And what did she see? What was her view? Bent over for nearly two decades. And I wondered what would her vision be like? This four foot view of the ground. Constantly frozen in this position of service. And so was that her treatment? Was that the status of less than that was you know, thrust on her because of that? Was that her view of life? Also started thinking about the religious leader in this gospel. I mean, how, how dare I start talking and speculating about that as one myself, right? But I wonder, you know, what's so wrong with following the rules? You know, rules that provide safety, that provide healthy boundaries. I have to do it with our son Holden all the time. What's so wrong with that? But I wonder, was that his view of life? And I wonder about this moment where they saw one another. I imagine they were a lot alike in their devotion to keep coming on the Sabbath. That's why they were both there on the same day. So maybe they shared that passion or that uh, faithful view to not waver from the law of observing the Sabbath. But do you imagine that, they, that their paths had crossed before? Do you imagine that they had ever seen one another, this woman focused on the ground and this man focused in the law and his, what he's doing? I met with this guy this week that I had known from a long time ago, but he messaged me in the community and said, you know, I need to want to talk to somebody. He had grown up in a, in a tradition with a very clear view of the church, a very clear cl clear view of the world and he was we just had conversation and he was wondering uh, what had he not seen maybe he had been missing something he was kind of having this faith rediscovery in a lot of ways and so he said I, I got this sense just from talking with him what he was craving for in a profound way was a community that would see him all of him his his questions, his wonderings, would see his view, and he was just desperate to know that, you know, I don't walk this road of faith alone. What am I missing? Help me to see. And so we kind of had this conversation about that. And I wondered, maybe some of you feel that as well. Maybe you feel like the other characters in this story of this gospel. Maybe you feel like the religious leader who is so, lives so busy, maybe so bound to the bottom line of his business or his projects that he lives kind of with this view of his smartphone three feet away and kind of lives in that world. Maybe that, maybe you feel or understand that. Maybe we live so bent over that view of the world that we need a little Sabbath for ourselves. Or maybe you know what it's like to feel like this woman in the story? To think that no one will ever see the real you or know you or understand you? To think that your spouse, child, friend, family, whatever, will not, cannot connect with the real you? And that begins to shape your view, the way you see the world, and you feel like you cannot raise your head enough to see another possibility. Maybe we live bent over in that grief. 
if, you've touch, if that touches you, if you've experienced that at all, we see what Jesus does. We see that Jesus sees that one who is suffering, who speaks a word to touch them, to raise them to a new possibility, to a new way of viewing the world, that they might be brought together to let them know that they don't walk alone, that God sees and knows and loves. And that's what this first reading in the community of Isaiah, which it's all about. They're all about rebuilding the city of Jerusalem, and it's not going well. So they're asking God for help, for guidance. They're looking to God to help them be restorers of the streets, which is a phrase from that that has just stuck with me all week long. And I think, what would it look like to be a restorer of our streets? And I think it would begin with seeing one another, with living and loving together. And it would be like the other things mentioned in Isaiah, that we would feed the hungry, that we would help anyone who is afflicted, that we would uh, share water with the one who is parched, spiritually or physically. That then I think we could become restorers of the streets of the kingdom of God. I think that's a challenge for us. I think Hebrews gets us to help make that, helps us make that jump because I think it talks about what if God's love is one, is a love that frees, that heals, that is poured out to both the woman bound to her view of the ground and this man bound to his view. What if living in this gospel of grace is something that bridges the gap between fear and illness and uncertainty and living in a view that says you are not alone, that we live and do this together as a community in, centered in the promise of God's love. What if that moment is a moment of Sabbath that we can experience in this life? That Sabbath of grace that Christ speaks in the story and then to us. Because that's the word that Christ speaks from the cross. A word for the woman, the man, for us. A word of grace that we might be able to see differently, a different view. We might see and share God's love and mercy. And there's no better way to do that than how we do it here at Calvary Lutheran Church. It's, it's astounding. We have ways to do that. September 8th, the day of service where we will be out in the community making a difference in another individual's life who cannot for themselves. I think of November 2nd. I'm big in promoting the Run for the Hills right now. I'm talking about running whether you choose to run this or whether you choose to volunteer for this, it all goes to support foster families and restore the streets and those homes or a community project right here in our neighborhood. That's where it's going for. Do we restore the streets of our own community? Do we see that our church and our community share this same view of love to restore the streets together? We have ways to do that here and we do that. I have to share one other story. I've been reading this book with our Stephen ministers, ones who walk with people who are hurting. We're reading this book by Donald Miller called A Million Miles in a Thousand Years. And he tells a story that I see just, it's just, it's lifted me this week. The story about what it would look like to restore the streets. And he tells a story about how he loves to visit this family that he's known for a long time. And the family was sitting around their house one day. It was New Year's Day. And the kids are saying, New Year's Day is so boring. Nothing ever happens on New Year's Day. They don't even have the college national championship anymore. So what can you do? So they're sitting there and they're wondering, what can we do today to make this day more exciting? And so they're brainstorming at the kitchen table and they have an idea. We'll do a parade. New Year's Day, we'll invite the whole community. We'll dress up, we'll, we'll get in costumes, we'll do music, we'll do fanfare, we'll do the whole floats, we'll do the whole thing. And we'll end with a cookout in our yard. And then they say, okay, so we're going to go out, we're going to invite the whole neighborhood. But the only stipulation being, no one can watch the parade. Everyone must be in the parade. 
So they went to door to door and they started knocking on doors and telling people about this. And the crazy thing about the whole thing was people started coming. <laughs> they came out dressed up. They came out in hats. They came out ready for this parade. And they came and they came and it grew year after year until you could not stop this community from doing this parade every New Year's Day. They decided they elected a parade queen. They would have a banquet the night before. They would give speeches. Oh my gosh, it was a huge deal. People who had moved away years ago would come back to the community to join that parade. The parade that no one was allowed to watch. That everybody had a part in. It was called to be about. And I thought, what, is, what if that's what this kingdom of God looks like for us? where we're called to view one another together in this parade of love, that we do not walk alone, but we share this love and that spills out beyond these walls to restore the streets of this world as the kingdom of God, to call others to line these streets with God's love. Thanks be to God for that view of the kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen.